2000, they started looking at ecosystem services and those benefits that are provided to the community through these different types of ecosystems. <coughs> And uh, I'm, I'm not going to quote the company that come up with this, with this uh, method, but what they're looking at is regulating versus supporting. So the benefits um, to the regulating, which is, is climate regulation, water quality, pest management, and then those supporting things that come from you know, managing those ecosystems. So when we're looking at agriculture as an ecosystem in itself, there are uh, those same benefits that are going in, as well as we've got food and fiber that are coming out of it. So what does you know that ecosystem mean to the producer? It means different things to different producers because it depends upon your system and the type of, of ecosystem that you're farming and how you're treating it. So here is a, a pretty good graphic of the different types of ecosystems. And everyone always says mimic rate, native range, right? So uh, over here on the right hand side, this is looking at ecosystems on, on similar types of soils, but in five different ecosystems. And those provisions that are being provided are on those, those color charts. So you can see in the forest situation, we're, we're sacrificing uh, food production. <coughs> we're not getting a lot of food off of the forest. We might be getting Uh, different components of that ecosystem to you know kind of flower out and, and be a bigger part of that whole system and a lot of that you're wondering how can that be done so first off we want to kind of consider the different services you know that are important to Kansas producers and if you're just looking at producers as a whole in the conventional realm not our you know agro ecosystem farmers I would call it Gale and, and there's a few others across the state that look beyond some of this, but this is the majority of our, our regular row crop producers. Some of the other things, though, that can be you know provided in that that ecosystem, though, are you know just management ease. Once you get to the point where you're farming in this type of system, there's a lot less management in trying to decide when you're going to you know apply fertilizers, when you're going to go in and spray, when you're going to go you know and scout fields. Uh, a lot of that can be a, quite a bit minimized when you're going to more of an advanced system. The wildlife uh, conservation is, you know, usually skyrockets in these types of systems. The AMF, that's that uh, Barscular Mycorrhizae Fungi, that potential there just, you know, really ramps up once you get to more of a native or mimicking that uh, ecosystem, that agroecosystem farm system. Uh, also, there's the nitrate retention and then the, the the NOx reduction and then phosphorus availability, that's a really big, one of the biggest though, components is that, that carbon, adding that carbon to the store. That's pretty much the whole piece of the puzzle that makes everything fit together. So here we are back to this again, you're saying uh, the four different principles of soil health plant, you know, I'm putting it out here as um, how to reap the benefits of these systems is by planting the cover crops, using diverse, diversify your rotations. And that means just not corn beans, it means adding in, you know, either cover crops to diversify your rotation 
or looking beyond that to a different cropping system altogether, which would be a corn, bean, wheat, um, working together with other producers in, in your, your area to uh, find a, a buyer for different types of crops. A lot of that um, in the you know farm mentality is, is very you know autonomous. You're very on your own. You, you plant your stuff, you, you sell it. You don't work a lot in groups or coalitions to find these different markets. And if you could do that, it, you know, and you could bring in, you know, different crops that could help with those uh, diversifying. So what does planting cover crops do? It increases your chemical, uh, there's four, four uh, factors when building soil. There's chemical factors, biological, and physical. The chemical, what that does is it increases that nutrient exchange by planting cover crops. Under the biological factors, you can see we've added in a lot of our different uh, soil critters, the, the mycorrhizae, the bacteria, we're getting that in more of a balance, and the columbulas, and the, uh, those tetagardes, the water bearers, all of those different types of soil critters feed off of each other and produce and then help with that chemical factor. And then the physical is pretty much obvious. That's that decreasing bulk density, increasing infiltration and available water. So when we're looking at cover crops, and he mentioned these different functional groups, this is one of them, and this is just some of the things that these different uh, functional groups can provide. And uh, if you go across the bottom, that's crimson clover, that's a pea, that's that medic, no, that's the chickling vetch, that's the uh, pea, and then over here in the corner we have sun hemp. So those are some different species that provide those different uh, services. Here we're looking at the broadleaf plants. You got your buckwheat there, phacelia, chicory, my favorite here, the sap flowering seeds, kind of wicked looking, the purple top turnip, and then we've got the daikon radish. Speaking of radish, I'll uh, show you this little poster board there at the PMC. We thought, well, they're selling all these radishes, right? And they've got a little different, lot of what? We've got four different varieties, and they all say one radish is better than the other radish. Well, we planted them all, and we thought, where are we going to see which one goes the deepest? Because the soil was all the same where there was that sandy loam. So we thought, we're going to plant all these radishes in here and, and see which one goes the deepest. Because, you know, the tillage radish is the radish you're supposed to have because it's going to go the deepest. And so we planted all of them, and guess what? They all went the same depth, which was the length of, uh, as far as we could get, was the length of the tailgate on the truck. Wow. So, yeah, just for illustration's sake, you know, everyone knows how wide that is. Uh, but we did not get, uh, the root is right here, it's about the size of a hair. It gets a little thicker pencil size, about halfway up that truck bed. And then we got this big tuber, you can see, up towards the upper end there. But they all perform exactly the same. So, we're doing it again this year, and now we put closer to water so we can wash everything and get as much of the root as we possibly can because it broke off. And they all do perform differently under different soil types. And you'll see probably under clays, you'll see more of them sticking up out of the ground like you see here, as opposed to, you know, uh, in that sandy loam. But we had that hard pan at six inches. It hit it and it popped up and out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's got the one on here. Oh, here, six inches. See my root? Whoop, turn. You can see right there that compaction layer, it turned. And then also we had found some worms in there. Look at that worm. <laughs> Look at that worm! <laughs> following that root, right down that root line, just right there in that space. So you can see there's a lot of benefits to all of these. Uh, I really like the, the biofumigation aspect of the radish and, and the, the uh, turnips both, because, I mean, that's an extra added component in pest management that a lot of people won't think about, you know. They really stink when they rot. Uh, the pollinator species is just one more component. They're great flowering species broadleaf plants. Uh, here we got our cool season grasses and you can see what some of the things they do. One of their biggest you know, claims to fame of course is sequestering nitrogen or you know, scavenging it, pulling it up, utilizing it, keeping it from running off. Um, also cereal rye and that, uh, I never say this right, allelopathic effect that it has which is you know, a toxin and it produces, keeps other, other uh, uh, plants from growing around it. That's a, that's a good thing when you're looking at weed control. Sun hemp does the same thing. I tell you what, that stuff's crazy with the amount of, of uh, toxin that it released. Three years in some of our plots, we still have weeds from that sun hemp uh, residue. Of course, we had eight foot tall sun hemp. I don't suggest you do that. You can't farm through it, it's horrible. 
Um, warm season grasses, you can see we've got uh, the forage sorghum and we've got the uh, a lot of the millets. There's the German millet, foxtail millet, uh, pearl millet, the brown midrib corn. A lot of these, you know, do these different things, but another thing they do that, you know, is a real big component is that is forage. So when we're looking at diversifying your rotation, one thing that we, you know, uh, look at is, is planting different species to allow that, that diversity, and whether it's intercropping or just adding another, you know, rotation into your current rotation. There's a lot of different things that you can see these, these do over time. Here's another good graph. This is just a corn a comparison of a corn bean versus a corn bean oat and a corn bean oat two-year alfalfa rotation. You can look at the yield here just from, uh, it's not very significant for, for the corn versus the beans, but it is a little bit higher, you know, in that 2006 to 2011, that's just five years. They got a little bit of a bump in yield, plus they got a, a different uh, crop that they had to market, alfalfa hay. Here's another thing, energy output. This is the amount of energy that was uh, used in order to put these crops in. You can see there's a significant decrease in the amount of, of uh, energy being consumed by putting in this four-year rotation. Um, the reason why the bump is so high on the corn is because they were utilizing manure as their nutrient source. And as opposed to it being a nutrient source, they were looking at as a, a, a dump, a nutrient dump, a way to get rid of something. So they wasn't accounting for it you know, as an added uh, fertilizer benefit. It was just something they needed to get rid of. And so that added one more operation to that, which resulted in, you know, more energy being used. But our other component is no-till. Of course, we said, and I believe it's the cornerstone of, so of soil health. Uh, Alex showed you that graph, the carbon. This is one of the big, the big uh, deals that adds carbon back. Uh, here is a no-till. This is a rye. It was cereal rye, and then he planted another cover in it. You can see how thick that is versus out in western Kansas. They were harvesting their residue off here for hay to try to make cover crops work. They figured you had to either hay it or you had to graze it, and they didn't have cows, so they were haying it. You see what a detriment to the soil surface that's done. No carbon. Uh, the comparison between the two, you can see that crusting is going to occur in that first three inches uh, versus the, com the conventional till versus the no-till. And a lot of the, but the one downfall of the no-till is that nutrient stratification. You're going to get a lot of layering of, of you know, some hotter uh, layers of, of nitrogen and phosphorus with the conventional, or with the conservation tillage as opposed to the conventional tillage because you're, you're mixing it up. So soil quality and no-till is a function of those physical, chemical, and biological processes. Uh, you can see those different uh, services that, that are being achieved. And so when we say mimic natural systems, these are the things that we're looking at. And what it does is provide, the big key here is providing more resiliency to that system. You're able to withstand, you know, a drought system in, in two or five years <coughs> in your neighborhood if, if they would. So how do you go about doing that? This is an example. Um, only 4% of this is in perennials right now. The, this is a computer animation. What's it providing? You can see this is just a general system. Crop production, we got really low uh, added benefits in the others. If we increase to, uh, it's 28% adding perennial, more, that much more perennial to this system. You can see we've increased a little bit on, on some of these. We, we've increased uh, quite a bit on our water quality at flow and regulation and also some of the carbon sequestration just by adding that little bit of perennial. And then we have, lastly, 64% of that, that uh, photo is in, in perennials, either trees, shrubs, brush, brushy cover, or grass. And you can see that we're mimicking more of that native system. It doesn't necessarily have to be within the field. You could even do it around the field in your lows, seeding those back down. A lot of people tore all that out and are farming them. Um, so in summary, uh, these are our four keys, and you've heard them from Alex, and you know we went through them here. But what they're doing, you know, is is overall is providing that that biology back to the soil that, that was missing, which then in turn increases that system and makes it a better system in the long run. Um, a lot of producers that go to this more eco-type farming, 
are become more observant. They're starting to key in on a lot of the different changes that are going on, either in the soil, with animal health, you know, from grazing these forages, and uh, also even in pest, you know, infestation, the decrease in that. I'll just show you this other uh, graph here. This is at, again, the PMC, we did the dye test. So it's kind of hard to see. This is an actual knife blade, which is grossly overgrown. But uh, what he did was he poured uh, this dye in, and he was testing some different dyes to see how deep they would go. You can see our six inch level right there. They kind of quit it right about there. But that's just kind of a, a graphic of how deep that uh, soil will, or the water will infiltrate when it's in that dyed system. That was just food coloring. We tried it out. Or no, RIT. You know, RIT works dye your clothes. RIT works really great, and it's about $200 cheaper, apparently, than that soil dye. It's quite a savings. So you can do this on your own farm if you like.